Welcome back to another episode of Jailbreak Overlander. Today, I have another live interview, and this time I'm joined by Kevin Estella. Kevin is a he is a pretty badass guy. Hold on, I'm killing myself here. What the F? All right, my bad, my bad. We had two uh, pages open. All right. Kevin's a pretty badass guy. I originally wanted to have him on because he authored a book called 101 Skills You Need to Survive in the Woods. And as you guys have followed me, I do that stuff all the time, and I'm always interested in learning more. The more I've discovered about Kevin is he is a pretty badass dude. Martial arts instructor. He is a writer. He does testing with some of the most phenomenal products that you can possibly get that I actually have most of them on me. And he's a history teacher. Kevin, what's up, brother? I really appreciate your time. I know I brought you up. I tried to bring you up before and I accidentally overbooked and forgot about you. And for that, I truly apologize. I do it all the time. I needed a butler and somebody just sent me one, which is really freaking me out. And I don't know who did it. So what's up, man? Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm doing okay over here. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's uh, pretty cool to be able to join your podcast. You know, it's uh, I, I wasn't aware of what it was before, but you know, I'm kind of getting the idea, and it seems like I'll fit right in. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Um, let's jump into this right off the bat. You have this book right here on Amazon: 101 Skills You Need to Survive in the Woods. It's in Kindle and and paperback, and it's it's so cheap you can't afford not to have it. What prompted you to write this? I mean, well, around the time that I started that book, uh, or I was thinking about doing the book, um, I was already writing for a lot of different magazines. So Recoil Off Grid, uh, Ballistic Magazine, Survivor's Edge, American Survival Guide. And, you know, I had done a, a number of uh, magazine articles, probably close to 100 or so. Um, you know, in 2012, one of my, my good friends, uh, Pamana Tuan, Chris Syak, he said to me, he's like, hey, when's your book coming out? And in 2012, I was a different person. I was like, I don't know. I, I, I'm not ready for it. And he goes, no, you're ready. You're ready. Well, a good friend of mine, Craig Caudill from the Nature Reliance School, he said, hey, I'm going to introduce you to my publisher. And I reached out to Craig's publisher and the publisher and I had a few chats. And next thing you know, uh, the publisher's like, send us a sample chapter, sent the sample chapter, uh, got my contract to write the book in April of 2018. And in April of 2019, the book was published. Uh, I wrote it over three months. My niece, who was only 12 years old at the time, did all the illustrations. My publisher had no freaking clue that my niece, who was not even a teenager, did all the drawings. And people were blown away by the quality of the drawings. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, the, the book is being widely, widely received by folks that are primitive skills guys, military guys, uh, modern bushcrafters, traditional bushcrafters. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like it's it's overwhelmingly accepted um, as just a good starting point for people to kind of get their feet wet with the great outdoors. And it's, it appears to be an easy to read. I skimmed through it on the Kindle. It's, it's easy to read. It's not complicated. Anybody can basically jump into it. That looks like it might go very well in a new backpack because I've noticed that you're hooked up with these phenomenal things, but you just did a great, you just did a great uh, write up in knife magazine. Was that your first time in that particular uh, knife magazine uh, was it knives illustrated or knives illustrated my well the, there's a blade right in the front so i can only see the k n i on the cover of it but oh yeah uh, which which one of those that is i i've right, right here a whole bunch uh oh yeah yeah that's uh my buddy my buddy ben orford he runs a uh, a bushcraft knife company out of england and my friend mike travis uh one of my instructors through my company uh he runs blue mountain bushcraft he has the knife and I was like, Hey, they're going to put this knife on the cover. They're looking for a really sick photo. And Mike is a phenomenal photographer. So he took the photo, they used his cover photo. They used my article and I was pretty psyched because I took that blade to St. John this past summer and I used it, you know, St. John got hit with the, the hurricanes a couple of years ago. So there was all this dead and down uh, wood that I was able to chop up on some private property and, you know, I used the tropical blade in a somewhat tropical climate and made the review as authentic as possible because that's what the readers deserve. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. You must love doing this. What what got you into this? Was this something that you had grown up doing or was it something that you did after school or after college or whatever? I'm assuming because you're a teacher, you had to hit college at one point, right? 
Yeah, I've al- I've always been a guy that's like gone out into the woods. I mean, in my parents' backyard, I would light little fires and have the neighbors come to the fence line and wonder, you know, if everything was okay because, you know, you're not supposed to have a fire in a suburban neighborhood the way that I used to light them. But yeah. uh, my dad really inspired me when I was a kid. Uh, he grew up in the Philippines. So when he grew up in the Philippines, it was World War II. The Japanese had invaded, and my grandfather moved the entire town into the jungle. They lived there from 41 until 45. So I grew up not interested in any professional sports. I just wanted to learn how to be in the outdoors. Um, of course, you know, being half Filipino, I'm going to be interested in knives. I love Swiss Army knives. I carried one every single day when I was a kid. High school, I, you know, I had one in the car. I couldn't bring it in the halls, but I always had one with me. Um, and then, yeah, even throughout college and grad school, I was still, uh, I was still doing things like working for Eastern Mountain Sports, teaching canoeing and kayaking. Eventually, I, I got hooked up with the Wilderness Learning Center. I started teaching survival skills there um, after training with uh, the Maine Food of Skill School and Jack Mountain Bushcraft. So I've always been interested in this just because, you know, my dad set a pretty good uh, foundation for me. And then uh, as far as the gear, I mean, gear is cool. Uh, guys love gadgets. And, you know, when I, was, when I was at Eastern Mountain Sports, I was able to buy stuff discounted, you know, twice a year. And, you know, I was like, man, this is awesome. I wonder what this would be like someday, uh, you know, to get some stuff for free and, you know, to, to be a professional product tester. And then I started reaching out to these companies using their stuff. They started noticing that I was using it legitimately and I wasn't just playing, uh, and I wasn't just playing in uh, my basement and I was actually taken into the woods. And then next, you know, one company reached out to another company saying, Hey, you got to meet up with this dude. You got to hang out with this guy. You got to send stuff to him. Uh, and it's just been a giant snowball, you know, just, that's pretty much how I got to where I am today. And, you know, with the help of some really good friends. So let's, 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 uh, I'm trying to find it. I think it's on your, uh, your website, which is, let me put that up while I'm doing this. The, the martial arts, how did you get into that? Do you actually teach it? Is that what you said? Yes. Um, I'm a Sayak Kali, uh, Filipino martial arts instructor. And uh, Sayak Kali is a bladed system, but we are a complete system. We teach everything from stick grappling to uh, projectiles, including, you know, firearms. Uh, we do, you know, everything from drawing from concealment to multiple opponents and so forth. Sayak is an amazing physical system. Uh, people often only see the physical side. They don't realize the strategy and the mindset training, which has allowed me to, to work with some amazing individuals. Like I see right now you have a photo of me with Bill Rapier. Yeah. Uh, Bill was Naval Special Forces for many years. He's a good friend out of uh, Idaho. Um, that class was actually up in Maine. And uh, that's given me some great exposure. So I, I'm a Filipino martial arts instructor. Uh, I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu purple belt. So I get my grappling game on. Um, you know, I get a chance to, to meet some very interesting people because of the diversity of the training that I have and the circles that I, that I run in. That is crazy. And we were talking about this before we went live. I've done some of this. I've done uh, training over the years, this, that, and the other thing, but nothing specific, just short classes at a time. And I've done a little uh, training with, uh, with knives and it always bums me out. You always want the rubber blade. And you were just explaining that you actually don't use a rubber blade because it could snap and you use a metal blade. That is insane. That's totally scary and insane. But I, yeah. I mean, I suppose you gotta, you gotta practice, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and there's a lot of logic too in like the, the gear that we use. So uh, for instance, like these are, this is the live blade. This is the, the training blade. You know, notice that the training blade is slightly shorter than the live blade because what that does is when we're using the training blade, when we make contact with whatever the vital target is, we're actually uh, training with the training blade to get that extra quarter inch or whatever we have on the tip uh, into our uh, opponent at the time. So there's a lot of logic into the, the gear that we use. We want our, our training blades to be as close to uh, as close to the real thing as possible. That's why many times the training blades will actually work in the same sheaths that we carry the live blades in. Um, and, you know, one of the things that separates us is that we actually have training rigs. You know, we have sheaths that are designed for our training knives. Uh, because you see a lot of martial arts where it's like, all right, let's go train with blades. And the guy walks off the mat, he grabs his little bag, he takes out his cute little knife from the bag. And it's like, you should already have that knife on you. You know, like our, when we train with firearms, do we pull our, our firearms out of the cases and shoot right. or do we pull from the ones we have in our, our, our holster? So uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, some, some good logic in the training that we do. That is crazy. That is crazy. 
so the the training knife is shorter than the live knife the live knife is just a straight up blade correct that's a real deal absolutely yeah this one is uh this one is called the northman it's made by uh, Amtac Blades, my serial number. A lot of people are jealous. I don't know if you can see it. Serial I number can, I, and I am jealous. Yeah, serial number 99. Uh, so it's one of the first 100s that was made. Um, but, yeah, it's they're, they're legitimate blades. I mean, a, a lot of people think a fighting knife, you know, if you want to use that term, a fighting knife has to be this long buoy. Um, but it really, your, your blade should be reflective of the type of training that you have. You know, we're not going to conceal carry a buoy uh, as easily as we could a shorter blade. Um, and a lot of the, the buoy style fighting was similar to the fighting that the Spanish did uh, with longer swords. So they were just adopting uh, a lot of the sword tactics to the blade, whereas, you know, the shorter blade should have its own specific techniques that are used, such as quick draws and so forth. That's crazy. That takes a serious amount of skill to, to mess around with live blades like that. So you must you must be good, man. Better man than I am, you know what I mean? I've got scars all over my hands from doing blade training incorrectly ever since I was 20. So, but I'm going to I'm going to blame that on the teachers. So, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, let me let me ask you. For there's a lot of people that are going to tune into this. This is kind of 4 o'clock in the afternoon here. For the 101 skills, if someone's just trying to get into this right now, what are the top 3 or 5 things you could suggest for them to do? They want to do wilderness training. Maybe they have a little bit now, but they want to jump into it. Which direction should they go? Does, um, can you work with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would say the first thing is to uh, recognize what readiness is. Uh, a lot of people will say, I want to be prepared for the worst, but preparedness is only a component of readiness. Uh, readiness is the actual, uh, the combination of awareness, preparedness, and willingness, you know, and this is the SIOC readiness formula. So, uh, awareness is obviously being aware, okay, having knowledge and having uh, observation skills to recognize what you need to do in order to become ready. Like, I should probably carry gear on me. I should probably do this and that. Um, preparedness is having gear, but it's also having training. And then willingness is the hardest thing for me as an instructor to teach because I could tell someone, you're going to carry this knife. I could show them how to use the skill, but you know, if they're not willing to use that skill or if they're not willing to carry that blade, then, you know, they can't say that they're truly ready. So I would say the first step is to recognize what readiness is and do an honest self-assessment because so many people say, well, yeah, man, I, you know, when I was in high school, I used to be able to run the 40 yard dash and, you know, under five seconds. And it's like, well, that's great. That was high school. But what about right now? You know, be honest with yourself. If you haven't run in five years, man, I mean, you can't say that the 18 year old version of you is the same as the 30 year old version or the 50 or whatever it may be. And so just be, just be honest with yourself would be the first thing and, and pack to your pack to the areas that you're not strong. Uh, I don't even like saying pack to your weakness because I don't like admitting weakness. Um, so pack to the places that you're not as strong as, as you once were. Uh, if you're horrible with making fires, carry multiple fire servers. If you are afraid of, uh, you know, I don't know, having a, uh, you know, an issue where you can't build a shelter, you know, off the land, then you should carry a shelter. Um, so, yeah, I would say that the first thing is be honest with yourself and assess your readiness. Um, you know, there's other steps, but that would probably be my first. So you, you did the, uh, you did the training with the, the, the knives right up in Maine. Do you yeah. travel and do uh, teach wilderness survival courses? All, all the time. Uh, I've been out to Washington state. I've been down to Florida. I've been, uh, I was out in Idaho a few weeks ago, Pennsylvania, all throughout the East coast. Um, I've been out to Michigan to teach. So I travel frequently to teach uh, various survival skills. Um, you know, it, it's sometimes people come to me. Sometimes I go to them. Uh, I enjoy traveling to different locations, even when I'm not teaching, but I'm writing about say like jungle survival. I don't mind going to, uh, you know, places that are easy access for the, the person that's looking to just test gear in a tropical environment. Um, but yeah, I, I love traveling and, you know, I think it's part of the adventure. You learn something new about yourself, you know, and in my case, I enjoy uh, getting out there to meet these people in all different parts of the country and seeing how closely connected we are, which is that common desire to, to become ready, you know, to, to learn how to take care of yourself. I do this stuff. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you're going to be stuck to my channel after this interview. You won't be able to pull your eyes away from it, but I do this all the time. I travel in an 80 series all over the United States. I meet all sorts of people and we just 
bushcraft, survival, and live off the land as much as humanly possible. But like you said earlier, being honest with yourself, I started doing this when I was probably about 30 years old, and I'm going to clock 52 in a week and a half. Nice. When I first started this channel, I didn't need these. Now I can't see without them. So there's certain, you know, lim lim limitations. My knees, I carry braces in my truck for my knees, my ankle, which I never did before. But somebody just asked in the comments, do you run a, uh, do you run a beginner's course? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I run a class called Budget Bushcraft, which – was kind of a joke because you know if you look at the bushcraft community there's all sorts of expensive gear out there i mean there sure is and, and don't get me wrong it's good gear uh but it starts adding up and the bushcraft community is notorious for kind of you know like kind of uh cannibalizing itself and you know the funny thing is people want the most expensive gear when you look at like the indigenous tribes and populations around the world they use some of the cheapest stuff but they're very very skilled so I was joking with my friends and I said, I'm going to run a class called Budget Bushcraft, where people are going to say that they went to a class for under a hundred bucks. People will question, well, it can't be good training. It's only a hundred bucks, but I'm going to blow people out of the water with the amount of knowledge I'm going to drop from a Friday afternoon to a Sunday afternoon. Um, and I almost always sell out that class between 12 and 15 people. And I've had people take it multiple times saying there's no way they can process all the information. Uh, and the funny thing is they always say it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, there's just too much information. And if anything, that's going to inspire them. Look, there is a lot of information. Get out there and train. Come back to me in a year or so and let's keep training. I'll, I'll level you up at that point. Um, so, yeah, I definitely run a beginner's class. But all of my classes, uh, something we can say is that people, whether they're beginners or advanced, they just like the idea that there are advanced uh, practitioners present, but no one's got an ego like some of my friends who are some of the most skilled bushcrafters that I know are the most approachable people. And we just want to see people get outside and be safe and have fun and enjoy what we enjoy. So yeah, I have beginners classes all the time. That's a short answer. That's phenomenal. And people, if, if people want to do this, the best place to go is to the website that I just had up. Correct. Uh, yes and no. I'll admit I am a little bit lazy when it comes to updating that website at this point, <clears throat> I, I update my Instagram uh, and my Facebook pages more frequently um, just cause updating the website, I don't have anyone that's doing my website for me. So, uh, I just put general information on there and if people need to reach me, my contact info is there. It's kind of like your bare bones website. Um, I used to be much more active with that, but the writing has taken over to a point where I don't have enough time. Uh, you need to a butler. That's the problem. You need a butler. I hear exactly what you're saying. Here's something funny. I want to say this before I forget. You were talking about, you said some of the people that took your class said that it was, uh, everybody's approachable, it was all good, blah, 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 but it was like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. Now, for the people that are watching right now and the people that are going to watch this after it's no longer live, I've met a lot of guys like Kevin in real life, special forces, highly trained guys, you know, a couple of SEALs here and there, and they're always incredibly nice guys and you never see it coming. If you look closely at Kevin, you can see it in his face that he will indeed teach you with a fire hose. You know what I'm saying? It's, you can see the intensity, brother. So that is pretty badass. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lifelong educator. I used, to teach, I used to teach swimming lessons when I was in, in high school and all the kids were deathly afraid of me because they were like three years old, you know? And here's this, <laughs> here's this, here's this brown dude that's bringing you around a pool. Um, and then I was a, a canoeing and kayaking instructor, survival instructor. I'm a high school history teacher. So uh, I have a passion for for hearing that, oh, you know, that, that right. moment someone yeah. gets it. I get uh, it. I get it. I get it. That's I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's phenomenal, right. man. So you've definitely got a thing for this. Where are you located or where's your main base? If someone wants to sign up right now and come take a class with you one on one, where would they go? Uh, I'm going to be running a lot of classes next year out of Clinton, Connecticut. So I am in the uh, occupied state of Connecticut where we're all have all sorts of taxes and they're trying to put tolls. Dude, you know. I'm in Massachusetts. So yeah, you're you're preaching to the choir. if it snows tomorrow, the governor will declare no one's allowed to drive and everyone will sit down quietly and wait till they're allowed again. I can't stand it. Yeah. So, so you get it. Uh, a oh, lot yeah. of classes are, are New England. Um, you know, so a lot of the classes are in New England, but I'll travel anywhere. So if someone has a piece of property and they want me to run something there, I mean, I've gone up to New Hampshire a bunch of times doing stuff like that, Maine. 
Um, but primarily, I'm going to be running a lot of things next year uh, out of Clinton, Connecticut. So right on the Connecticut shoreline on a, on a piece of private property. Well, how about this? Maybe I'll hook up with you after this. Maybe I can get two of the subscribers to, to get down with me. And is do you have a limited, like, would you rather have five people at a time, one person at a time, 10 people at a time? What's better for you? Because I'll, I'll set it up so that 10 of us come down at once if, that's, if that worked. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've done I've done the budget bushcraft classes before for smaller numbers, but you know, when you got a group of twelve, then I can break uh, that group of twelve into three groups of four. I can break it up into two groups of six. Um, I can get you know six partner groups. I like having the number twelve or the number fifteen as my my student numbers. Um, but here's the thing: like, I've done private classes for one person. You know, I've been hired for an entire day just to teach one person for eight hours. Um, I usually say eight hours, and then I go. Uh, you know, 10 or 12 and people right. are like, I'm tired, <laughs> you know, and everyone says uh, I got to slow down. But yeah, I have no, I have no problem teaching any size group as long as again, they're willing because that's the, uh, that's the, the thing that really matters, you know, when it comes to readiness that you're willing to, to trust the training and, and go after it. Well, it looks, I'm looking at the comments as you're talking and it looks like we're going to, we're going to set that up for real for real for real even if i embarrass myself because richie's getting old but it is what it is i'm still i'm still game um would i be able to uh, videotape a little bit yeah i'll tell you we wouldn't we wouldn't be putting an online class on but i want to do an overview of it that would be phenomenal yeah here here's what i always tell students i say if you show up to my classes without a notepad you've already made a mistake uh i encourage students to scribe everything to record portions of it um, you know, in my release form that my my sister, who's also my attorney, drafted up. I mean, the only thing that I, I ask is that you're not going to use any videos for any of your own financial gain. You know, and that just makes sense. Right. Um, but if you want to put it out there for free and let other people see, like, hey, this is the class that I took. It's awesome. Then that helps me. I have no problem with someone uh, recording and segmenting pieces together. So, uh, yeah, that's not a problem. I want people to scribe it. In fact, I want people to go home and share the information with someone they know and, and teach the next person. And that will just kind of reinforce the lessons that you've learned. Yeah, I, I find it's funny that you say scribe it, scribe it. Have you been a writer since you were a kid? What, what turned you on to that? What what made you? Because I've tried. My, I made. I've been making videos for ten years. I, I'm I'm like a half a million subscribers on three different channels. Blah blah blah. But I suck at writing, and I've actually been trying to describe what it's like driving alone through the desert at two o'clock in the morning and there's nobody around for a hundred miles in every direction like a writer would and it's hard it's really hard what 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 brought you to this well you i mean don't knock yourself too much because when you're describing something in a video it's different than writing it in text form uh you know we think in pictures if i were to say the word ar-15 right now people aren't picturing the letters AR-15, they're picturing a black rifle of some sort. You know, like if I were to say coffee cup, you're not thinking of the word coffee cup, you're picturing the coffee that you had this morning or whatever. So no matter how you were able to record information, it's all scribing, it's all documenting. Um, personally, you know, I like using, uh, I, I like using little notepads. I've got, as I sit here on my desk, this is just from like last year alone, I've just got a big bunch of notepads that I, I keep track of. Um, I'm always making a to-do list. Every single day starts off with a to-do list and I, I crunch all my goals for that day because of that. Um, you know, here's here's what I'll say. In, in terms of writing, I've always been someone who has enjoyed reading and, you know, the best writers out there are those that enjoy the words of others. So I've always enjoyed reading. I've always found, uh, you know, survival books interesting. So I know the words that they chose, the, you know, some of the famous writers that came before me, and that's how I'm able to, you know, use similar words to get it out to my audiences. Um, but I was a writer in college, you know, I wrote for the school newspaper and, you know, in grad school, I had a couple of papers published to uh, the Harvard Studies Project at Trinity, you know, Trinity. Trinity, um, I caught that, I caught that. So I've always, I've always been a writer and to be able to write about cool gear, oh my God, that's, uh, that's so much fun. Um, I always tell my editors, I'm like, okay, you gave me 1800 words. I'm giving you probably 2000 and I'm not going to be the one that's going to tell you which part to cut out. Like, just do it for me because I can't cut anything out. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes perfect, perfect sense. Let me ask you this real quick. Let me, uh, give me one sec. The only, the only hinky thing about this particular platform is it takes a couple of seconds to screen share. I wish it was a little faster, but 
it's amazing to me that I said, hey, do I have all your links up? You said, well, I didn't put Kafaru up. I have Kafaru. Kafaru is phenomenal gear. How did you hook up with these guys? All right. So the, the history of Kafaru is before they were Kafaru, the owner, uh, Patrick Smith, he ran Mountain Smith. Uh, Mountain Smith, I first learned about in like 1992 when I saw the Stallone movie Cliffhanger. And I saw Stallone carried a Mountain Smith pack. And I'm like, dude, I got to get a Mountain Smith pack. Rambo's carrying a Mountain Smith pack as he's right. climbing. So I learned about Mountain Smith. I became a fan. I carried a lot of their gear. And then a friend of mine, Jerry Young, in 2006 said, oh, you know, there's a military branch of Mountain Smith called Kafaru. And I said, military? He goes, well, yeah, military hunting, uh, backcountry. And I noticed that it wasn't all bright red and teal blues and greens. It was actually like colors that helped me blend in in the outdoors. Next thing you know, I call him up. I say, hey, I'm an instructor with the Wilderness Learning Center. Can I, can you send me some information about your products? Uh, and I ordered a couple things. Next thing you know, I order some more. Next thing you know, they're starting to sponsor me and saying, hey, test this out. Let me know what you think. Um, Ten years later, I travel out to Mount, I travel out to Kavaro for the first time. I get to hug my contact out there. Angie, if you're listening, uh, such a sweetheart. Uh, I get to shake hands with my friend Aaron Snyder, who's the new CEO of, uh, of Kafaru. And I, and I get the chance to finally meet these folks who, they're real. They make everything in the United States. You are going to pay a little bit more because it's American made. It's not being made in sweatshops overseas. Everything is very compliant. Everything is guaranteed for life. Um, I've had stuff from Kafaru that I've been an idiot, a total dumbass, and I've damaged, and Kafaru has taken care of. Um, they stand by their products. When you go out to Kafaro, you'll meet the folks out there that are doing the sewing at home and doing the repairs at home. Um, it's a small company, but it's a family type of environment, and they're just freaking awesome. So um, I will always be a Kafaro supporter, and and I will always use their gear. And you'll, if you look through my Instagram feed or my photos or whatever, you'll usually see me with one of their packs or their jackets on or something like that. I did a review on not the latest. I think it was the year before last. They came out with the reckoning bag and I did it. It was a terrible review. I did it on my patio with a crappy camera, but I believe it's still up on one of my channels buried someplace. But Oh, you mean this, this bag over here? It is. There it is. Yeah. It is. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got mine in gray. I thought it was phenomenal. They, the, the harnessing systems, they take, they go through such pains to make sure that that harness fits you properly. Cause almost, at least 80% of the people that are non-military that put a backpack on that aren't hikers, even if it's a phenomenally made bag, they don't have it on right, and it hurts. Kafaru fit low. really, really well, man. It's a killer company. I, I almost fell out of my chair when you said that. Kafaru, I'm like, I just found a pouch in the other room I forgot I had. I love this stuff. So I live this stuff. I use it. So it's awesome. All right, let me ask you about these guys then. Let me see if I can get this up here. Sorry about the delay, but it's like I said, YouTube decided to change everything up. Everything was working perfectly, so they broke it. Oh, yeah. Prometheus Design Works, man. I'm looking at these clothes before you even jumped into the live stream, and I'm looking at them going, I wear Triple Out Design. Every, every, every day I wear Triple Out Design, except I don't wear my Ranger hoodies in the house. I almost always have an Under Armour shirt on. Because I try to stay away from anything that's not made in America and that's made in a sweatshop. I have a problem with that. Yeah. I'm looking at their pants, and man, they sure do look familiar. Is, is there some link here with uh, with Tag Gear by any chance? Yeah. Uh, Patrick Ma is the owner. Uh, Patrick is my Asian brother from another mother. He's, uh, he's California-based, so I kind of feel for him being out in California. But they're a really, really slick company. Uh, again, they, they're one of my sponsors. I met them uh, reviewing just one of their watch band compasses. And then I started writing, blogging for their, uh, their sister company called Danger Ranger Bear. Uh, so I, I'm on their, uh, the pen name as Mountain Gorilla. And uh, I get a chance to, to write about like how to cook trout in a bushcraft environment, how to, um, you know, I wrote a, a blog about traveling to Iceland. Uh, they're a really cool company. Patrick Ma used to work for Tad Gear. They uh, had a uh, parting of the ways and Patrick started uh, Prometheus Design Works and he's got some amazing clothing, whether it's the fleece jackets, the wool jackets, the pants. Um, 
you know, he's partnered up with some big names in the in the outdoors industry. He's got Dave Wenger, who makes great knives, making a number of knives and hatchets for him. So they're a very progressive company. They've got some really cool gear. Uh, almost all of it is made in the United States, if it's not all in, made in the uh, U.S. And uh, yeah, they're they're just outdoors people. They love overlanding. They love camping. They've got some cool uh, morale patches, which you know, if folks are into the morale patch game, they've got some pretty funny ones that kind of hint back to Star Wars and Bruce Lee and like good 80s and, you know, 70s retro stuff. So I, I love that company. This is a sick pack. I think I've seen this before, but I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't pull the trigger for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. 2019 yeah. high commended by Cariology. That's saying something that's big. Yeah, he uh, Patrick is is a smart guy. He doesn't like just throwing stuff out there for the sake of putting his name on it. Like, you know, it's funny in the outdoors industry, there are so many folks that are quick to brand everything with their their name, and it's like, uh, let's have a moment of pause before you throw your name on anything. And you know, unfortunately, so many instructors, so many outdoor personalities are all about uh, like flexing their merchant skills, you know. And it's like, are you an instructor or are you a salesman? Um, you know, I am self-admittedly like one of the worst salesmen when it comes to promoting my own gear, uh, stuff that I, I use. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, I, I make up for that as, as an outdoorsman, you know, an instructor, um, Prometheus, they really put in the time. They want to make sure everything's right. So the customers happy. well, the good, I mean, you say you're reluctant to talk about the gear that you use or salesmanship, the sales, if if you have things that you're interested in people buying so you can continue your lifestyle and continue the entire circle, because we live on this earth and we got to pay to live here. So you got to make money somehow and you're, you're giving up a, val a valuable service, but writing about the gear, what's legit. See, that's the main thing on my YouTube channel. I've already been pissed off some seriously big players in the Overland community because I got their gear and it broke and they gave me a hard time. Well, don't do that because I make videos about stuff like that. Too many people will just everything's as long as they're getting gear for free to review, et cetera, et cetera. That's always a glowing review. Just tell the truth. Yeah. You know, it's someone like yourself that goes from Maine to Connecticut to the jungle to California with a particular backpack. Talk about it because people want to know that the, the up and the downside before they buy it. You know what I mean? It's valuable, I think. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize is, uh, you know, when you look at any review, most of the times, uh, you know, the reviewer is either getting it at a highly discounted price or they're getting it for free. Um, and that's often lost on the reader. Um, many times people don't realize that there's gear sent to these reviewers like myself that it just doesn't meet muster. Like it, it's not it's not what I expected. And rather than blast someone or flame them, um, you know, in an article or in a on a website, I would rather contact them directly and say, listen, before I put anything up about this, I want you to know, are you going to fix it? And many times just that reply to that email that I give them, that will dictate my next action. You know, I have two courses of action. I'm either not going to put up anything. I'll wait for you to correct it. Or if you tell me to go pound sand, then I'm going to say, okay, you don't have the customer's best interest. Here we go. And I'm going to let it fly. Um, you know, and that's the thing, like the reviewers, yeah, we get a lot of shit because yeah, we get a lot of cool stuff for free. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that we get that doesn't ever see the market um, because it gets sent back. And, you know, personally, my integrity tells me don't review something that I wouldn't use myself. Um, and as a knife writer, I've been, I've been given opportunities to write about some knives that are absolutely, absolutely terrible. Um, and they're like, Oh, but we'll give you 400 bucks for this or 500 bucks for that. Or, and it's like, you couldn't pay me to use that knife. You couldn't pay me to put my name behind it. And, and I've been very careful. Uh, it's almost political at that point. Um, you know, which, which products I, I throw my weight behind. Well, everything you put up here is it's just kismet let's call it that i can't think of a, a more clever word because i'm a terrible writer but everything you have up here i basically have in this room and i've used it all and i whittled my way down from the you know the max edition and, and just moved up accordingly stuff that wouldn't break stuff that wouldn't fail there's nothing worse than a backpack that fails there's nothing worse than getting in your lifted truck and your pants rip at the crotch because they were made in a sweatshop in china you know what i mean just stuff like that so this this is just phenomenal for me, it is. I'm psyched. Let me ask you this one then. Oh, I got to screen share again. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop explaining every single time I screen share that it takes a long time to screen share. 
Here we go. How did you hook up with these guys? Because these guys have been around for a long time. Yeah, Fiddleback Forge. Uh, they're a great company out of Georgia. And it's funny because the owner and I, when we first met, it was on Blade Forums, an online discussion forum about knives. I was a moderator and I I kind of <laughs> I kind of insulted the owner when I first met him. And I, I <laughs> we laugh about this today because we are good friends and you know I joke about his wife and you know and, and she's a sweetheart. Uh, I love Leah to death. Um, but the funny thing with them is I we we got off on a bad foot. The next thing you know, uh, Andy, Andy Roy, the owner, is like, Hey, do you want to design a knife? And I sent him a sketch. Uh, there's a knife that's called the K E Bushy, which Kevin Estella Bushy. Uh, it's become one of their best-selling knives. And Andy and I are, are great friends. I write for this company as well. I do a, a monthly blog for them. Um, so right now I'm in the process of just finishing up a review. I'm going to have an article all about habits that you should have if you're a, a guy that you know fancies himself an AR-15 shooter. These are some good habits that you should have. Um, you know, and I, I've tried to mix it up. I do some survival stuff. I do some stuff that's related to firearms, some stuff related to, to readiness and prepping and, and whatnot. Um, but Fiddleback, I, I've gone down to their their user weekend in April, and I've taught down there. I see them every year at Blade Show, which is a giant party. Um, I don't feel like I'm working when I'm walking around Blade Show. I feel like I'm just at a giant like reunion, and I get to hang out with people that just are awesome, awesome individuals. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, that's those are some of my good friends down there in uh, in Georgia, my, my southern boys. Yep, they definitely make serious blades. I didn't know you actually. So you just, they told you to design one. You drew up a style that would, that would it must have been something similar that you were already carrying, I'm going to guess. Like you knew what you would want, et cetera, et cetera, because I don't know how that whole thing would work. Yeah, uh, a lot of people, you know, call themselves knife designers. And I mean, if you can draw a knife, you can technically be a knife designer, at least the outline, like the the rough, you know. Um, right, I'm hip, I'm hip. Um, you know, my knife designs tend to come from a background of, of actual use, whether it's the KE Bushy or the, the Gossman knives Polaris or the Gossman Bolo. These are all knives that are, that are conglomerates of like all the designs I've used over the years. Um, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, there are some knives that you'll carry a lot and use very little. There are some knives that you'll use a lot. There's some knives that you'll just have in your collection and, and never use. Um, you know, I see a lot of people commenting right now, you know, Rambo knife, K bar knives, everyone's got a knife. They're all highly, highly personal. Um, but it's funny if you take away all the ego, if you take away all of the, the drama behind knives and you say, Hey, which is the knife that's going to get the job done? You know, you focus first on the function and then you focus on the form. Um, you know, I, most of my knives are under four inches long, uh, in terms of the blade. Most of the handles are good full size handles. They don't have any hot spots. If you're carving all day with a knife, your knife is going to need to look like a carving knife. It can't look like a tactical blade. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people that want to have one knife that fits all. And the thing is, is that when I when I eat a meal, you know, at a fancy restaurant, I'm not going to sit down with one fork. I'm going to use the, you know, the soup spoon for eating my soup, and I'm going to use the knife for cutting my steak, and 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 you know, use certain tools for certain needs. Um, but all my knives, they all. Uh, the knives that I carry, they all have function at first, and then I worry about the form later. It just happens that the form tends to be pretty appealing since the knife makers know their their crate their 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 trade, and uh, and they do their craft really well. Without a doubt, without a doubt, I would. I'm this is this is literal. And my dad, my dad's seventy two, and he still gets up at four thirty. He goes to work. He's worked at the same place for fifty years. He goes to the gym. He power lifts. He drives home, smoking a cigar in his Cadillac. He's nice. carried a knife. I've probably gotten him in the last 40 years. I've probably bought him, I'm going to say, three dozen different knives. Kershaw, uh, uh, Benchmade, mm -hmm. uh, Zero Tolerance, etc. And he always carries this really small HK knife that you, you press it and it somehow opens. I can't open it, but... If I leave my house and I don't have a knife, I turn around and go home because it's 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 amazing that you can get through the day basically living regular without a knife, but I'm I'm naked without it. And it blew me away that on that website that you popped up, I saw Strider up there twice. Twice. I've talked to Mick a couple of times on Instagram. Instagram's cool because it brings people together for the most part. 
for the most part. And in the comments below, it will be pinned. Kevin's information, everything I just showed will be pinned in the comment section. But again, Instagram, if somebody wants to hook up with you for personal training, group training, but we are definitely, I'm going to get 12 people from this channel and we're going to schedule this, do what we got to do and figure out a time. We're all going to come down there and take a class. So it's eight hours is what we were saying earlier. That's the thing a day. Yeah. Usually, I mean, usually that's for like a day clinic. It's between eight to 12 hours. Um, but my budget bushcraft, people show up around six o'clock on a, on a Friday, they camp out overnight. Uh, we start up on Saturday. We do the entire day Saturday. Even when we're taking lunch, there's always training. Uh, even when we are, you know, hanging our hanging out by the fire at night, there's always something to talk about. Uh, Sunday, we wake up early, we keep going. Uh, and then we finish sometime around like two or three o'clock in the afternoon on, on Sunday. So that's all for 99 bucks per person. Um, and that's why it ticks off people in the bushcraft community. Dude, are you shitting me? I was, I was actually afraid to ask. I kept thinking, I'm already, I'm already, I'm already volunteering 12 other people. I'm already making commitment live in a video. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's yeah. ridiculous. I might pay for everybody. Yeah, the only catch, and I and I tell people it's not really a catch, it just makes it easier on me, is I tell people for 99 bucks, I'm not providing food. So just pack a couple mountain house meals or MREs or whatever. Without you know, a doubt. You know, That's and we'll make we'll make bannock together, we'll break bread together. But uh, you know, I always find that if I offer one thing, someone will complain, oh, it's too greasy or oh, it's too healthy, you know. So you can never really make everyone happy when you provide food. Uh, usually with the bannock though, when I show people how to bake bread, uh, or do fry bread, it's hilarious. Cause you'll have like one dude who's, uh, who's like a slant guy sharing his bread with, you know, the, the soccer mom with the NASCAR dad and everyone just wants to like hang out and feed each other bread. That's um, a trip, man. That's but yeah, for nine bucks, that's, that's what you get. You get like two and a half days of training. Is that the end of the class when you actually make the bread? No, no, we do it on, on Saturday. Uh, I tried doing it early, early on on Saturday one day during a <laughs> during a heat wave in in this was in uh, uh, in Massachusetts. And when we did it during the heat wave, everyone got food coma, and I pretty much was teaching a bunch of zombies for <laughs> like the next six hours because no one wanted to move; they were just sweating. Uh, so I do that. Ten, I usually tend to do that at the end of the day on Saturday. See, my book, my I got a lot of friends out west, Moab, uh, Arizona, Colorado. I spend a lot of time out there. I try to spend half the year out there if I can. But I made the mistake of swinging into Moab. My truck broke down in Colorado. So I went to my buddy's shop in Moab and it was August and it was hot like an oven. But yeah. it still wasn't a summertime heat wave in Massachusetts where you, as soon as you walk outside, your body is just dumping all the liquid in it. So eating bread during a heat wave while doing a survival training class or a, a bushcrafting class is probably no joke whatsoever. So, wow, I didn't. Re I thought you were kidding about the ninety nine dollar thing, man. That's crazy. That just opened up a lot of options. Yeah, like I said, it was just it was a gag at first. I'm like, oh, let's just do this just to tick off everyone in the bushcraft community that's asking people way too much money for skills that should be free. Um, you know, and it was. The whole idea is I didn't want to make it free because if you have something of value, you shouldn't just give it away. Right. Um, $99. If a person said, wow, that's a bargain. That would be great. Uh, I've had a great number of people that have taken it over the years and they love it. The other thing about, uh, I, I mean, supplying people, trying to supply people with food and keep everyone happy this day and age, you you're risking somebody having an allergic reaction and everything going, you know, legal. So I think it's a, I think you I think the way that you're going is the smartest idea. Ninety nine bucks for a, a, all that training that's phenomenal. That is totally phenomenal. Samantha just said, "When is this class?" I'm going to figure that out afterwards. And anybody that's really serious, really serious, email me rjcjr10 at yahoo.com, and I'll get it figured out with Kevin, and we'll get it all figured out. That's totally crazy. Best way if someone wants to reach you is through e I, uh, Instagram, correct? Uh, that's a qu that's a very quick way of doing it. Um, you know, folks can do that. They can email me at a Stella Wilderness Education at Gmail. It's a lot to type out, so I don't get very many spammers that want to, you know, say, "Hey, Mister Stella Wilderness Education." You know, they don't ever do that. Um, but yeah, you can email me. You can Instagram me. Uh, you can hit me up through Facebook. You know, I'm I'm around. Estella Wilderness Education at gmail.com. 
Correct. Yes. All right, I'm typing that in the chat right now, just so I don't forget. Because this all replays afterwards, so we can pull any any of this pertinent information out. But yeah, this is definitely going to work out well, dude. You you are like a Rambo, man. It's definitely like a Rambo, Rambo and a Trinity shirt. That is badass. Yeah, Rambo was uh, probably one of the the movies that I looked up to the most when I was a little kid. Uh, you know, I watched it. Uh, dear God, I don't know how many times. I've actually been out to where they filmed the the movie First Blood twice, and I did an article on uh, you know the movie and following in Rambo's footsteps and whatnot. And I was able to take the green cord off the knife and make traps with it. And, you know, I saw the Rambo cliff where he does the, the swan dive off the, the cliff and into the tree. Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a Rambo junkie. Um, That's but, crazy. I can but, see it. I can see it. And there's a bunch of people watching that can, you can see it in your eyes, even though you're a high school teacher, you can still yeah. see it. No, I, I'll never, I will never claim to be something I'm not. Uh, I never served in the military. I've got a lot of friends who did uh, and who are. Uh, I've got a few friends who were uh, former or who were Green Berets, like the guys at Fieldcraft Survival. Mike Glover, he's a Green Beret. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a military guy. Um, I have the utmost respect for the military. My family on both sides, the Polish side and the Filipino side, they wouldn't be here in this country if it weren't for our veterans. So, um, Polish and Filipino. Yeah, Polipino or Filipino Pole, whatever you want to call it. Polipino, nice. I'm Polish and Italian. That's what I'm, a, I'm Italian with blonde hair. It makes no sense. I'll, I'll let you guess if it's, you know, this side of me that's right, 50 right. or, you know, from the, the waist up, you know. But uh, yeah, uh, utmost respect for those dudes. Let me ask you this. How long have you, uh, how long has this book been out, the 101? Because, like I said, this is what originally caught my idea. I thought you were just an author, dude, I, to be perfectly honest. I double yeah. booked you the first time and then screwed that up. I did it again today and then we lost power earlier and I almost didn't make this. But um how long how long has this book been available? 101 skills because I don't think I've seen it. No, you probably you probably haven't. It's only been out since April. Oh, uh, right. cool, cool. Yeah, so it's it's still less than a year old. Uh at last time I checked there was it was like 86% positive uh rankings, a lot of five stars. Uh you know, one of the things I'm most proud of are the people that threw their name behind the book. Um, you know, I've got a couple of guys that were, you know, former SEALs. I've got a couple, uh, you know, very well-respected primitive skills practitioners, including Tony Nestor and, and Mike Douglas from the Maine Primitive Skills School. Uh, I've got modern day guys in there that are that are just studs in their industry. I've got Dr. Nicole uh, Appellian, uh, who is on a loan. You know, she's a, an amazing individual. So I'm just really proud of the people who have supported me. And I was very pleased with the way it came out because, you know, that's the least that I could do if they're going to throw their weight behind my name and have faith in me. I couldn't pr put out a product that was going to suck. Right, right. I totally agree in that. I totally, because some people, I mean, especially after they get the first book out, and if it does well or does mediocre, their publisher just keep just keep cranking them out, and they start doing that. I don't. I wouldn't. I mean, I can't write, but I wouldn't do that either. You got to have some principles, and it appears that you definitely have that down pat. No two ways about it. I'm stoked, man. I'm stoked. We're gonna have twelve people come down and come down, or, or we'll meet you someplace. Whatever works out better. Yeah, yeah. even if you want to. If you want to like find a place where you go overlanding, if they allow camping and there's a campground, we could do it right then and there. I mean, if well, you're in the I just did a video on Halloween. Halloween, we were up in New Hampshire. I know a place where fifteen to a thousand of us could get away with no problems. No, and it's totally legit. Totally legit. So I'll hit you on that. But let me see how many, I want to make sure I get twelve people, and I'm not going to be a dick, but I'm going to vet this to make sure everything is all legit. With, with these guys, you know what I mean? Make sure that they're real, they're going to show up, and they're physically able, that's all. I don't want to discriminate or anything, but we don't want anybody it, falling out on us. Yeah, and here's the thing, too. Like I've heard people say, oh, I can't train, I can't train, I've, I've injured my hand. And it's hilarious because training takes a lot of different forms, right? Like even when I'm injured, I've broken my hand, uh, I've I've had a, a, a torn rotator cuff, I've had my, my cornea... Uh, abraded, you know, two out of the or three oh. out of the years, bad injuries. I still found ways to train. Like you can train visually, uh, you can watch films, uh, you can do a lot of different things. You can be present when there's training and still get that rep of, of you know, thinking through the scenario. So when people say, "Oh, I don't know if I could do it," it's not like I'm going to be holding a gun to anyone's head, telling them to do push-ups. You right. get out of your training what you put into it. 
Um, and that's something other people need to realize, like whether you go with me, right. As an instructor, or you find another survival instructor or martial arts guy, uh, you really need to find the martial arts or survival instructor. That's going to fit you. Um, because for the person that wants to like hug trees and, and find out about their healing powers or whatever it may be, they're not going to do well with the guy that's like the former air force survival instructor, you know? Right. And those guys aren't going to do well with the person that is going to say, don't carry a knife, uh, just carry a little, you know, pair of scissors, you know, like you got to find the person that's going to uh, fit your personality. And, you know, the one that you could see yourself learning a lot from. Um, so that's, that's my advice for those. Cause I mean, you're going to probably invest a decent amount of money over time. You know, that investment should pay for itself. Okay. Let me ask you this then for yeah. the people that are going to, that, that want to sign up for this, class what what are they what are they in for like how should they be prepared to come to the class because some of these people including myself to a to a, a bushcraft i've never been so yeah uh i always tell people we're gonna we're gonna be near vehicles right i don't want people to be uncomfortable in terms of training the first time around especially with some of these skills like we will be using sharp knives so if we're using sharp knives, I don't need people that are going to be physically exhausted where they're going to run a higher risk of cutting themselves. Um, budget bushcraft classes, they're usually very comfortable. They're usually, uh, you know, with something nearby, like plenty of plenty of food, plenty of water. The only thing I'm going to ask people to bring are the bare essentials, right? Like enough, uh, you know, uh, enough paracord for when we get into lashing, you know, fire starting equipment. Uh, you know, there are some other things that you can purchase, but you don't need to, to, you know, spend an arm and a leg on, on gear before you even know what gear you need. Um, right. On my website, I've got a Amazon affiliate store where I've kind of listed just a, like a two dozen or so items. And before every course, I'm going to put out like, Hey, you sh this is something you should get. You can find it elsewhere. Cool. You know, but show up with X, Y, and Z. And anything else that you bring is all gravy, you know, bring, <laughs> bring whatever you want. Um, you know, there's certain things. I don't like it when people are, uh, are excessively drinking during classes. You know, it's not so bad afterwards. Like we're all done for the day. And if someone wants to have a beer, but I don't want to have to deal with drunken idiots. At all, and nor would I, nor would I, if you're coming with me, I wouldn't appreciate that. If you can refrain for the day, that would be phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but that's the thing. Like, Everyone thinks, oh, my God, it's a survival class. Do we have to eat bugs? I'm actually not going to ever push bugs on anyone because most of them have parasites, and I'd rather show you edible plants. Right. Uh, you know, so it's not it's not like uh, you have anything to worry about. All my guys that help me out, they're all very, very responsible. They're all good guys. Um, I would trust them with my sisters. So Really? You know, yeah. That's, really, it's something. that's that's quite the saying, too. So that what you just said – gives me a great idea of the men that you spend your time around. So there you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean to interrupt, but that's a good no, say. I'm just reading some comments. Sisters. I agree. Drunk people are annoying. Uh, you true. know, you can't really say you're ready if you're not, if you're not aware and alcohol is a great tool to uh, destroy your awareness. Indeed. Uh, yeah. So I'm just reading some of the, the comments and they're funny. What I'm going to do is I'll, I'll, uh, Let's see how many people come for. I mean, I know I'm going to get 300 emails, but let's see if we can whittle it down to a solid 12, including me. So that's 11 people. Yep. And, and then I'll get a list. I'll get a list from you. Well, you tell me if it gets, if it's bigger, it's bigger. It's as long as that's cool with you. I don't want, I want you to be completely comfortable doing this. And I don't want it to be where you're running in circles all day, answering questions to 50 people. You know what I'm saying? I run off of caffeine all day. So don't Sweet. worry. Uh, if there's 15 people, I can accommodate that pretty easily. And Mimi prays she can't make it because she's disabled, but we'll get video for her so she can feel like she was there. That's easy peasy. And I'll get a list of you of things that people should bring with them. Yeah. Just so everyone's bases are covered. That's easy. I didn't even know we were going to do this. See that? See that? And we really will do this. This will be, as long as the, the good Lord's willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be there. Sounds Either good down time. or we, we can go up. But if it's New Hampshire, it's going to have to be like right away or in the spring because it's already right. freezing up there. It was snowing on Halloween when we were up there. It was snowing bad. All right. I think we covered basically everything. The website, uh, Fiddleback, 101. This So this is a new book, which is why I, I'm glad. I'm glad because I try to keep up to date on this stuff. And I'm like, I don't think I've heard of it. And the book is what caught my attention in the first place. The response, I'm looking at the, I mean, people on Amazon are brutal, brutal, because it's keyboard warriors again. 
Yeah, he didn't mention this one thing. So this book sucks. He's a hack. They do it all. I mean, keyboard worry. Uh, what a new invention, huh? It's un I deal with it every day, all day. That book was supposed to originally be. Uh, they told they didn't give me a minimum or a maximum length, and I presented them over a hundred and one thousand words. And I was like, all right, hundred one hundred one thousand words. Then they came back at me and they're like, all right, you got to cut a third of it. And I was like, there's no way. And they said, if we ran all 101,000 words without any photos, it would have been like 250 pages. And by contract with their printer, it could only be 192 or 196. So we were able to get it down to about 80,000 words. They had to cut a whole bunch of photos, which drove me nuts because there are so many good photos that I wish I could have included. Um, but the way I look at it is, I even say it in the book, that book should not be your sole teacher. You know, and if I were to claim that you can learn everything you need from one book, I, I would be giving you a, a disservice as an educator. So uh, I was satisfied with it, understanding some people would criticize me for saying, oh, you don't have enough photos of this or it's just the final product. But, you know, here's the thing. I wish I could give you the unabridged version, but the, it was it was out of my hands. Um, and I'm trying to make up for that by flooding my my social media with a lot of the, the skills that are shown in the book, but with additional steps or additional videos, or just if people come out and see me, they could say, Hey, do this skill right now. And I'll, I'll demonstrate it in front of them. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it was pretty brutal to get some of the reviews, you know, cause it's like your baby. You don't want anyone, you know, talking trash about your baby. Right, right. Um, but overall I've always learned, and this is something, you know, if the listeners can take this one to heart, the, the opinions of the people that are closest to you are the ones that should matter the most. Um, you know, I consider my tribe, my, my, my inner circle very close to me. Those are the people that matter to me. If my dad ever said to me, hey, you're a screw up, that would sting. If uh, any of my SIAC instructor friends were to say, hey, Kev, um, this was horrible, I would take note of that. If it's just some random dude that's online who, you know, is, is really ballsy because he's got a keyboard, I don't care. I'm not losing sleep because I've never met you and I never will because that's that. It's so, that, um, that. I try to stress that to my subscribers because a lot of times I try to check the comment section and there's always a troll in there that's just probably drunk or whatever. I don't engage them. Just don't engage them and they'll wither and die. You can't let the, you know, if the, the, you're never going to make, if you're in a room with 10 people, it's almost impossible to make all 10 of them happy. If you're in a room with a thousand people, it's just not going to happen. And that's what the internet is. And these are all anonymous folks for the most part. So right. uh, is, did the did the publisher, well, I mean, I, I'm sure it's been too soon if it just came out in April, but would they, if they cut that much of the book out, couldn't you just do a part two? 101 uh, more reasons? Uh, I mean, 101 <laughs> more skills? Uh, so you'll be happy being an, an overlander. Uh, I had a whole separate chapter on... 10 additional skill sets that you should you should know beyond the 101. I included skills like, okay, here's how you set up a camp kitchen. Here's how you uh, you stage your vehicle with the right equipment because we live in different domains. The gear we carry on us, the stuff at our house, uh, the stuff in our vehicle, stuff at work. I had all these different things laid out. How to, how to properly shoulder a rifle and use a carbine and understand how to, how to read targets and, and I had all these different skills on there, like how to canoe a canoe or a paddle a canoe. Um, and they had to cut it all out. So if anything, I've got all that material that I can use for a later book. The second book, believe it or not, more than likely is going to be a book all about the camp kitchen um, because the publisher does a lot of them. And I've got a lot of really cool recipes that I've learned from, from good friends over the years. And, and just being an outdoorsman, preparing wild food in the, in the wild, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that one. It will be an easy write. Um, and uh, again, it, it's going to be probably book number two that I'm just tweaking the final proposal. And hopefully I'll have that, that paperwork and that contract going pretty soon. That's badass because everybody that interviews you out of political correctness, well, I'm going to be very interested in that book, Kevin. Well, I am going to be very interested in that book because when I'm on the road for 30, 40 days at a whack, Years ago, I was doing Mountain House and Patriot Pantry, and it's bad for it's bad for you when you're driving the entire like mer survival food. Use it for survival. It's good if you use. I, I love breakfast skillet. I eat that every you know a couple of times a week. But I need to learn to cook better on the road, for real. And it's a pain in the ass. So for someone to make a book like that, that's going to be phenomenal. I will be one of the first people to get it. So I'm stoked for that. Nice.
because cooking out cooking when you're mobile cooking in a camp it's there's you it's no joke it's not easy plus you yeah. have to clean everything up you don't want waste afterwards you don't want to dump food anywhere near the the camp etc 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 yeah and it's tricky too like uh, as someone who travels a lot and someone who like I'll be 40 in April um, you know, as someone who travels and trains, it, it's hard maintaining consistency with diet. Um, you know, the thing is, like, if, if I want to be really good in my jujitsu game, I know that there's a certain weight that I can still work with the big boys and I'm still quick enough with the, the smaller guys. And if you're traveling constantly, Mountain House, oh, my God, I love them. But the sodium content's ridiculous. Your ankles will turn into hot air, uh, hot water bags or whatever they're called. So. And it's Something, it's almost an art. Like when you get you get to a new place, you know, when where do you go to resupply, and what do you supply with, and you know, it's uh, there's no doubt about it. It's it's hard maintaining that consistency. So, all right, man, we have cracked an hour. Unless you've got something that you want to get out there, I think we've got the website, Kevin Estella. Dot com that's easy and are you going to be are you going to be upgraded because a lot of people that are following my channel i'm banned from facebook i'm not allowed no. at all i got in a big argument with them and they said okay goodbye but between the website for people that want to hook up with you to do a private class or a group class or whatever use the website or kevin estella on instagram because they could message you as long as they message you and wait for a response as opposed to Hitting you with 600 messages because with me, that goes straight to spam. I don't even want to hear it. Yeah, I get from like the guy in the cave in, in Afghanistan who's trying to like troll me, you know, <laughs> saying, hey, I love you, sexy friend. Uh, and I usually post them up because I'll entertain them. Uh, and it's kind of funny. I'll, I'll say, oh, I love you too. Oh, you know, and the next thing you know, they're, they're asking me to send $1,900 to some random place. Because um, you just won 600 million rubles, but you have to send them 1,900 USDS first. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a Kenyan mil millionaire now. Yeah, uh, yeah. We yeah all places, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I try not to get too too nuts on, on either of those platforms because I've had people who are not, uh, exactly keen on me, you know, going on a safari and posting a picture of me killing an animal to then donate to a bunch of school kids. <laughs> they didn't like that. I got banned for, for like three or four days because I it's had a amazing, band. it's amazing, dude. I mean, the follow -up, the follow -up real quick was hilarious. Cause I did the, I did like a, a photo where I showed, all right, here I am shooting the animal. We're processing it. Oh, here's the actual school. Oh, here's me standing with a, a kid in an African school where, who we just fed. And they still didn't like it. Uh, so whatever, I, I'm okay with people hating. Yeah, it's in this day and age. I mean, you're you're almost forty, so you've seen the you've seen the transition in the United States. It, this day and age, it's so easy to get someone to shelter in place or to trigger them or whatever. And the stuff, everything that we talk about, basically falls into that category. You can take care of yourself. You might. It, it's it, people don't get it. People don't get it. Grocery stores have three days on the shelf at the very best. And most people don't even know how to fish or hunt or it's just yeah. sad. There's an old expression. It's uh, civilization is nine meals away from disaster. Um, and, and I believe in that. I, I really think when you cut away the, the supply chain, you're going to see civilization get really, really dark, really fast. Um, and then it's going to come down to the haves and the have nots. Without a doubt. With absolutely without a doubt. So, all right, Kev, I am going to cut this, shut this down, and I'm going to spend the next couple of days getting compiling a list of people, and then we're going to figure out the logistics of it and get this squared away. This is going to be awesome. I had no idea I was going to even do this whatsoever at all, but I already said it. People are already responding. So I really appreciate your time. Anytime you want, you need to come back on, you got something you want to talk about, hit me up, brother. Yeah, I'm, I'm always around. <laughs> You know, I'm up early and, and I, I work through the night. So uh, if any time anyone has a question, they can email me. Uh, I'm very straightforward. I'll say if I don't know something, I'll let you know. I don't know, but I'll put you in contact with someone who does. Um, there's no ego. You know, I just want people to have the best information that's out there. Sweet, sweet. All right, brother. Richie from Jailbreak. Kevin Estella from Let's Do This Real Quick. Wilderness Education. He's also repping a phenomenal, phenomenal Fiddleback Knives. 101 
skills. Take your time coming up. 101 skills that you need in the woods. I mean, are you kidding me? It's 13 bucks to have it in your hand, 10 bucks to put it on your Kindle. Kevin Estella also on Instagram. And I can't forget Prometheus Design Works, Kafaru International. All the links will be pinned in the comment section below. So you can't say I didn't leave them for you. We are out. Thanks, guys. That was...